What's up, everybody? We're back once again on the Taylor Price Talk podcast, season five, rolling along. And of course, we have to bring out the red carpet for a very special guest, former 49ers quarterback. He's the uh, the, the guru of the QB school on YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter. He's, he's breaking down film, coaching some high school football, doing all sorts of great things. But we got to talk to the man, JTO. JTO Sullivan, thank you so much for making the time. How are you doing? Impressive bookcase behind you. I got to give you props for that. You know, I, I never miss an opportunity to show it off. Uh, maybe someday I'll read all of them. No, it's uh, I, uh, I would never have thought it would turn into a studio, but it is, uh, it is essentially my man cave. And uh, it's nice to be able to kind of use it not only as kind of a trophy case, but a little backdrop. Sometimes it proved to people that it's real. It's not like the, uh, you know, the green screen. You can go. No offense. Green screen peeps. <laughs> Absolutely. It's not a Zoom background. He, he's, uh, he's well read with the PhD. We'll, we'll talk about all that. But uh, JT, I mean, we worked together, I'd say work casually because I was an intern for the 49ers in 2008 and you were the starting <laughs> quarterback. And my entry to the NFL was seeing you and Alex Smith and Sean Hill and that, that uh, hotly contested quarterback battle, Mike Martz, the offensive coordinator. Uh, you know, your, your guy uh, worked together and obviously you won that job. And that's where I want to start is your, your 49ers experiences, because to me, that's how I recognize you. But you also spent, you know, many other places in your NFL career, NFL Europe, uh, 10 different NFL teams, uh, just so many different experiences you had. But where does that 49ers experience rank for you being a UC Davis, uh, California kid? Yeah, I mean, it's right at the top for a number of different reasons. I think obviously when you get a chance to play, that certainly impacts, you know, what you remember about the experience. But for me, I grew up a 49er fan. You know, I grew up in Sacramento. Uh, you really went to 49er training camp every day for many years when it was in Rockland, you know, and kind of remember those Ricky Waters, Steve Young, Jerry Rice, John Taylor days, when they uh, beat the Chargers in the Super Bowl. Those were special memories for me as kind of someone falling in love with football. So to play for your team like that was a, was a really cool opportunity. It, it came for me kind of like halfway through my career. And so I'd gotten the opportunity and I knew how kind of lucky I was, fortunate enough I was to get an opportunity to play. And it was just uh, kind of a cool opportunity for March to give me that opportunity. Certainly didn't go uh, as well as I would hope, but at the same time, I'm really proud of the, the effort and the opportunity to uh, kind of to get there and, and see what it takes. Now, I want to talk specifically about the quarterback battle because this is like revisionist history. We're going to go back decades, okay. but, you know, Alex Smith was the number one overall pick and he had his beef and his run-ins with Mike Nolan. They, they were still figuring out that relationship and Alex had the injuries and was still working up his confidence at the pro level. And then Sean Hill is such like the guy's guy. People just loved him. He was so revered in the locker room. And you had this relationship with Martz where, you, you know, you came in having that experience with him. And that, that must have felt good, though, for your confidence to, to battle it out with the number one pick, Sean Hill, who, who played the year before um, and won some games. And, you you know, best versus best. What was that mindset like every day in the training camp and in the, in the offseason battle with those guys? What was the dynamic of that, that room, I would say? Well, I mean, there's a lot of questions in there. Well, let me first, the, the first element of, as far as the room, uh, both those guys I have a lot of respect for, obviously went on to continue to have great careers. And... Uh, the actual competition, though, was really a two-person competition. I mean, I, I was coming in as someone who just knew Mike's stuff from Detroit. I wasn't walking into that competition. That was really, in fact, I didn't take a rep in a team situation, any OTAs, any offseason, not one rep. And so I think what really happened, and you'd have to ask Mike for sure, but I think he was, and I mean Mike Martz, not Mike Nolan, I think Martz was getting a little frustrated with uh, how the how those two guys were kind of dealing with the offense, and I just I had such an advantage because I knew not only Mike's system but Mike's expectations and how he expects the ball to be delivered and those decision making elements of it. And I was going to do what he asked. You know, I was there because I had that understanding and relationship with Marts, and so I wasn't going to kind of go off script or, or do my own thing. I was certainly going to try to do exactly what Mike Marts was asking us to do, and I think that really helped me. And at one point during training camp, I want to say like the first week, something happened with Alex's arm or Alex, uh, I, I forget, or maybe one of those two guys got kind of a sore arm and complained about it. And Mark, Mike was like, all right, you're done for the day, JT, you take his reps. And I just never stopped taking the reps from that point on. 
And so I think Alex ended up getting hurt too, going on IR. And so it was just, uh, you know, a lot of things fell my way in that training camp, but I certainly would have uh, appreciated a little bit more of the off season work, but that's just the reality that, I mean, that's the reality of being a, a fringe guy. You get the opportunity you get and, and you go from there, but it was, uh, it was certainly a hell of a lot of fun to play so much more fun playing than, uh, than not playing, but it's, uh, you know, and it's, I, I chuckle when I hear it's a, it was a real competition because it really, you know, those two guys really deserve, Sean played so well the year before he deserved an opportunity to compete. And I was just the outsider who kind of fell into it. Absolutely. I mean, you, uh, you were very focused. I remember, you know, your persona, your, your demeanor back then was very much like about your business. You did your media, you know, you were very, you weren't as like gregarious as maybe some of the other guys in the locker room, but you were very focused and respect to you. You got the, they got the job. You started week one, uh, looking at the box score, battled it out with Kurt Warner, um, Isaac, uh, excuse me, Larry Fitzgerald, Anquan Bolden. Those are some, so some battles there. And then week two, you win in Seattle, throw for 300 yards, uh, beat the, the Seahawks on the road. Not many 49er quarterbacks have been able to accomplish that. So I know the season didn't go the way you wanted to. There was a change. Uh, Singletary takes over for Nolan, and you end up losing the job. But uh, at least there's some high points in there. And winning in Seattle, if you watch all these games now and seeing how hard it is to beat the, the Seahawks, the 12th man, you accomplish that. Where does that rank in your, your playing experience? I mean, that's definitely one of, the, one of the high points for sure. It was a blast to go up there. Uh, Mike Marks, again, I mean, he had a lot of confidence going in there, being from the Rams for so many years. He always called playing in Seattle, playing in his North Campus. And so it was kind of a, a mindset that we were going to go up there and, and just try to do what we do. But it certainly was, it is and was deafening. Like I remember being in the huddle and we didn't have a silent count and uh, we, we couldn't function. So we just kind of invented a silent count in the game. And so it was probably as contentious as it ever got with me and Mark uh, about that type of stuff. But it was just fortunate enough to go up there. I think we won that in overtime. Frank had a big day. We had a couple. We I think we had a pick six too. But it was a uh, it was fun yeah. I think there. Pat ran one back by like sixty yards. Pretty vintage yeah, Pat Willis. Our, there you go. That was, that's what it takes. But it was it was a lot of fun. And it, and it you know winning on the road anywhere in the league is difficult. And uh, doing it against them in that kind of environment, I think it just makes it that much sweeter. So you look at your career, you've, you've had all these different stops. I want to talk more about other places in San Francisco, but this six degrees of separation, but you're actually interacting with all these great legends. You mentioned Frank Gore, Patrick Willis, Mike Martz. Um, that locker room that year, Isaac Bruce, uh, always <laughs> enjoyed my interaction with him on the sideline. He was he was an interesting cat. Um, you know, what what'd you think about that that era, that team? Because obviously they went on to have success with with uh, Harbaugh in the Super Bowl years. You saw some of those players, Vernon, Pat, Frank, really at the like the cusp of their come up. What, what was it like, you know, being with around those guys? I mean, it was uh, my perspective of it was always kind of like the new kid in school. Right. Like there, many of those guys had relationships before and had relationships after I was there for a year, and barely even a year. But my kind of perspective was always just like, man, this is a talented locker room. There are talents. There's really talented guys in certain spots. I think collectively the roster probably wasn't where it was when they started making those deeper runs into the playoffs. But there were certainly bursts of talent all over the place. And it was fun to follow those guys. And they were you certainly got the impression of impression early on that they were pros pros you know you, you you hang around frank long enough you see how hard he works you see how hard he runs you see how serious he takes the off season and and you know that those kind of things kind of repercussion kind of dwindle out into the locker room with guys like joe and uh you know it's, it's fun to see those guys go on and have success and have the careers that they've had it really uh it was kind of cool to uh look back at those relationships Absolutely. I left out Joe Staley. How, how could I do that? You know, you forget about Joe. I think he's still playing, but he's not. He's, have you seen him? He's pretty thin these days. No, I bet he probably could still play. Maybe not if he's that thin, but he'd probably play something else. He's pretty, yeah. I mean, all those guys, I think people sleep on the athleticism of those big guys, you know, across the board, but really the, anybody who plays on the edge, uh, man, they've got some quick feet and dynamic athletes. Isaac Bruce, Frank Gore, you know, going to Canton, but Obviously, so many other people you've interacted with in your NFL careers from Belichick to Brady uh, down the list. Who are your favorite, if, you know, those moments of I can't believe I was a teammate of this or I, I worked with this coach? Like, who are those maybe, you know, just pinch yourself moments of people you experienced in your football career? I mean, those guys for sure. I think Brett playing with Favre, uh, Brad Johnson, uh, 
Brady, Belichick. I mean, it, it was less about, it was more about, and I'm sure you've had some uh, version of this where you meet someone that you look up to or, or have looked up to at some point. And it's impossible for those people to live up to the expectations of what, how you hold them on a pedestal. But at the same point, they still, you get a chance to see that kind of greatness in action all the time, every day, if you're fortunate enough to work with those people. And so I get, I try to pick and pull things from Tom, from Brett, uh, even from Belichick, you know, and how he handled himself as a head coach and his interactions within that building. I still try to pick and pull, not necessarily to be someone else, but to, you know, hijack some of the best things that, that resonated with me that he did with me as a player. I still try to use to this day. When I look at your career, I look at, you know, Ryan Fitzpatrick and, and some of the things he's accomplished of bouncing from different teams. And there's this label that it's unfairly used, whether it's a bridge quarterback or, you know, a stop gap, but you, you came into the league as a six round pick with the saints and lasted over a decade. And, you know, most careers are three years at best, even if a, a late round draft pick is lucky to make a team. Um, how do you reflect on just your career and, and just what you were able to accomplish in the game, whether, you know, all these different opportunities, but just this wealth of knowledge. And, the, and we'll talk more about how you're giving back that knowledge, but you know, what, how do you just assess like what you were able to accomplish where you, from where you started and, and what, it, what it looks like from the exterior? Yeah. I mean, I think you're being a little bit kind to me too. Uh, the, I always think of it as a, I was a division two non-scholarship student athlete and to get that and to get a decade in the league is a far exceeded anything I ever thought ever, you know, just playing professionally probably exceeded my expectations going from not getting a scholarship offer to that. But I'm really proud of what it was. And I'm really proud of it because I know inherently the effort that I put into it. And so I, I, I think that I sucked the bone marrow out of that career and really looked at every single option, went to three, you know, multiple continents, kind of did everything I possibly could to make that thing go and know and, and can kind of rest my head asleep every single night, knowing that I literally did everything I possibly could. And I think that there is some sense of, you know, calmness knowing that, Hey, I didn't leave anything on the field. I didn't leave anything in the weight room, in the team room, in the meeting rooms. I did everything I possibly could to maximize that opportunity and with that, you know, there comes a level of satisfaction and, you know, certainly not everybody gets to go to the hall of fame and not everybody is even a career franchise guy, but I think everybody can maximize their effort. And those kinds of things are the things that are transferable, you know, when you get outside the game. Absolutely. And the fact that you're sharing that knowledge, the people you've come into contact with, and now you have the QB school um, on YouTube, just breaking down tape and it really, you know, caught my attention. I was talking to you earlier. Um, Saturdays during the pandemic, not a lot to do. The Niners traded up for the third round pick uh, or third overall pick. And I started, you know, wanted to, to learn more about Trey Lance or, or Mac Jones or Justin Fields. Like, what are these guys good at? What are their strengths? And, um, you know, yourself, Chris Sims, all these former quarterbacks, I take more stock in what you say maybe than some of the analysts, just knowing that you've been in those meeting rooms, you know what the offensive coordinator, the head coach are expecting of these quarterbacks in their system. So, um, you know, what was the, the starting point for you to start the QB school? And, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the film breakdowns. But, you know, what was that like spark or that idea that, you know, that registered for you to I want to give back to you know the football community and, and share my, my opinions? Yeah, I mean, well, really, it was I had just finished school and I had gone from feeling like I had no time to feeling like I had some time. And I had kind of taken basically a sabbatical uh, from football. I didn't really do anything when I was in grad school. And now all of a sudden I had this time on my hands and I was like, well, do I want to get back into football in any capacity? You know, just kind of, I really had kind of exhausted myself of that element of my life. And so kind of realizing that I, I didn't really want to try to get into the broadcast game as much as I didn't want to get into the coaching game, just because I moved around so much playing that I don't, I'm not interested in that anymore. And that's just mm -hmm. part of the deal if you, at the highest levels. And so kind of checking no's off all these things like no not coaching at the highest level no not broadcasting uh you know all of a sudden you're kind of out of options to a certain degree but also realizing like i always i i try to be a little bit ahead of the curve whether that's whatever you're doing you know not not necessarily best practices but like what will be the next best practices and this idea being that hey man i'm getting all my content from youtube like I just, I'm the first, one of the first things I go to is YouTube. 
And I felt like I wasn't the only one doing that. And I also feel like I'm kind of old when it comes to that also. So the next generation is doing it even more. And so I was looking to not necessarily uh, compete with different entities, but I was looking to just avoid uh, competition. Like, where is there a space that this, I see a gap and I could potentially fill it by something that I could offer whenever I wanted to really flexible, autonomous opportunity. And there were certainly people on YouTube doing a little bit more highlighty stuff and really high level stuff, I think, but not necessarily in this one bucket of what I, what I wanted to fill. And what I wanted to fill was basically what I wish existed when I was kind of thirsty for football. And that was, you know, as a fan, you know, diehard fan, I want to learn more about X's and O's, kind of pull the curtain back a little bit. And then also as a player, you know, are there elements, technical elements that I think I could have really benefited from hearing earlier? I think that there were. And then as a coach now, kind of clicking that button too, as far as, uh, you know, trying to get better as a coach, an influencer, a leader, those types of things. And so all those buckets kind of funnel into what has now kind of evolved as a quarterback school. But it, it really started with just me being like, hey, do I want to do any sort of football anymore? And then that kind of fell into coaching and, and all these other things. And it's kind of taken on a life of its own, to be honest with you. Yeah, absolutely. That's such a theme from all these these interviews or conversations I've had with former players where the game is so much a part of your life and it's the the highs of the highs and the lows of the lows. But then it's like, what what do I do to fill that void of the competition or like the connection to the game? Because you can't do something 100 miles per hour for so long and then all of a sudden completely stop. For me, it's this podcast for other folks. It's broadcasting, coaching, um, you know, mentorship, whatever it is in their communities and their outreach in, the, in their neighborhoods. But uh, I think what you're doing is awesome and really interesting time because of this whole creator economy where you can start a Patreon or a YouTube channel, a Twitch account, whatever it is, do multimedia to connect to a younger demographic. And you mentioned this Gen Z audience, they're very much rabid for, for football news, but also consume it differently than our traditional even Twitter might be outdated for, for how people of that age era. So you're in tune with it from the, the folks you coach, but also it sounds really great. Um, what's been the feedback though, maybe from your former teammates or football community about, you know, Hey, JT, I saw that video or what's just the general reaction for maybe that, that uh, peer peer set of your former players or anybody that in the football world that comes across your content. For the, well, <laughs> the people that, speak to me or on the phone or on face-to-face -face have been positive. I'm sure that there are some opposite of that somewhere, but many times, uh, oftentimes from other players, it's kind of like, Hey, tell me about your setup. Tell me about your workflow. Like, how are you doing this? Like, what does it actual take to do this? And, and you touched on it a little bit with the whole creator economy, but there is kind of this, you know, uh, it's no secret nowadays. Many young people will say, Hey, I want to be a YouTuber, you know, as they're like aspirations. And the idea being that you can, if you can generate enough revenue to make this a profession, I think is fascinating that I didn't know existed three years ago when I started this, you know, and to see how it, it kind of evolves is kind of the main thing. But as far as the football itself, I've had a handful of people that I've actually quote unquote analyzed, reach out to me. And those are always a little bit uh, interesting, but I honestly, I hope it comes across in the channel, but I'm just trying to be honest. Like I'm saying the same things that would get said in the quarterback room, like, you know, it's not always positive. In fact, I don't think even the guys who are the best in the world, they want to be coached. And if there are elements where they can improve, I think it's the coach's kind of responsibility to pull those out and push them in that direction. So that's the one thing that, you know, anything that I say, I would sit there and watch it with the guy that I'm quote unquote analyzing, because that's what I would say if I was the quarterback coach or if I was the coordinator that, you know, that's, that's kind of how I could be at least at peace with it. I'm not taking shots at very many people there are a few people that I take shots at but it's mostly just in fun yeah I was gonna ask you about your tone and your, your style so your delivery I, I was watching like a what was it Justin not Justin Fields uh Zach Wilson and there were some throws where you know people want to say he's the next Mahomes and he's got this great arm talent and you were just being like brutally honest uh like that was a bad throw what is he thinking here uh, the only thing was missing maybe from your setup was like the dim like lighting, like maybe just that one overhead light, because it did feel authentic to the film room where you weren't buttering them up with praise undeserved, like you were being very matter of fact. And I think that also speaks to your personality, but also just like that dry, like, you know, uh, delivery that you have. Uh, and so I, I appreciate yeah. that as a viewer where it felt like you weren't being fake or phony or, or trying to be liked or trying to be cheesy for engagement. You're saying, 
this is the flaws in his game. These are the things I like. Uh, and that really came across in someone like Wilson, who, you know, everybody's saying how great he is, but you were saying these are some of the throws you can't get away with at the next level. And that's where that authenticity comes through. It comes through. Well, I mean, I appreciate that. The, the, other, uh, the other thing that I would add that I use as a crutch is very rarely is it just me kind of pontificating or preaching my opinion. Like usually I'm just describing the film. Mm -hmm. Like you might not agree with the description, but I think I get away. I have a little bit more leeway because I'm just describing what, you know, what's happening on the film. And, and many times I try to say, Hey, you know, I don't know for sure. Unless you're in the quarterback room, you really don't know for sure. There would be many people on the team, even on the offensive staff that don't know really what this read is. So for me to sit here with a clicker and pretend that I can tell you exactly what he's supposed to do, you know, all the time is, is just disingenuous. But I try to be as authentic as I possibly can. I try. I try. I, honestly, I'm just being myself. Most of the things that I watch, I'm just naturally curious. Curious about. Like if you go across and look at the landscape of of kind of the content that I pump out, I like you know the Ohio State offense. I like I like what BYU is doing. Now it sure helps that they've got guys that are coming out high in the draft that I can kind of pump out the content with also. But I'm curious about that just as a coach, as a player, as someone who likes ball who likes the X's and O's part of it. So that part of it kind of overlaps for me. That's one of the benefits of this. Yeah, I would encourage everybody to go to the QB school on YouTube, uh, on Instagram, Twitter as well, and check out the breakdowns. Very prolific too. Not just like one video for five minutes. There's like multiple six part, 10, 20 minute breakdowns. So uh, for like the real hardcore football aficionados, uh, and especially Niner fans, you're going to get all and more on Trey Lance. And so I want to talk uh, a little bit more about the, uh, Lance and what he brings to the NFL. Um, it, just the whole scenario, you, you know, about Kyle Shanahan, the Shanahan offense, the, 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 you know, the bootlegs, the play action, the, the motion, the things that he's, they, that they like to do, but maybe they don't do as much with Jimmy G. Uh, tell me about just Trey Lance's fit and, and how you saw maybe the evaluation of obviously everybody wants to be the GM and decide what they want to do, but how do you feel now that the dust has settled about what they did with Trey Lance at that third pick? I mean, it's fascinating, right? Like, I mean, no, no one will really know until probably a half decade exactly what, how it all shakes down. I think everybody in the space, I say in the space that it, that really looked at the quarterback position, probably just evaluated the fact that whoever goes third is going to have a great opportunity to be really successful right away. I mean, that, that at least was my initial take. I think it was fascinating to see what they gave up to get, Trey Lance there, you know, to be honest with you. I think he was from got, from someone who looked at a lot of those guys coming out as about as in-depth as you possibly could without being part of the league, meaning that I didn't talk to these guys. I'm going just off the film. Trey Lance was by far the hardest to get a real take on because all of his film is from two years ago. And he was one of the youngest, if not the youngest guy coming out. And so it's just hard to evaluate, you know, what does the COVID do? How much better did he get? And those guys obviously could go watch him work out, talk to him break down, get a feel for how he thinks, how he processes, I'll use that in quotes, how he like, you know, makes sense of his football. And so I think he's got a massive upside. He might have the highest ceiling out of all those guys. It will be fascinating to see. I always kind of chuckle when people say, you know, the Shanahan offense, or this is what he's known for. I think that really good coaches, and I think he is a really good coach, have the capacity to build it around whatever talent that is. I think he's got a chance to be a very talented quarterback and so to see what that offense evolves to under him I think will be one of the more fascinating elements I personally am a, am curious too just because the quarterback coach over there is a, is a friend coach me in college I think he's a he's a bright guy too and so how you know Scangarella kind of puts his fingerprints on what that looks like will be interesting as well and so you know I, I just I, I'm really excited for the 49er fan base it's certainly going to be fun to watch this thing go but man you know so it's just, I would love to, I think at some point you should write the book about like how it really went down because there are so many like smoke mirrors, stories, who's this, who's that. You know, my buddy told me that it's going to be Mac Jones and all these types of things that kind of run away with the draft cycle storyline to just know like really what is it, what is, how did it go down? Like, cause I don't know. I, I'm sure, sure some, somebody, somebody knows and somebody who knows is not going to be working there in two years. And so it'll be fascinating to, to kind of peel back the layers to see what the hell actually happened. Absolutely. And I think, you know, the other part is what this does for Jimmy G. If you look at just, um, he's a, he's a competitor. He saw the, on the other side of it when he was pushing Tom Brady and that relationship. And, and I'm expecting this to, to really bring the best out of Jimmy G and for him not to just hand over this job. So 
I don't know really? if Trey Lance is going to take it in, week, in, in the first month. What, I mean, how do you see this competition playing out? Do you think Jimmy G – I mean, I know the investment of the trade. Like, there's no way it, – it's he's on borrowed time. But I think, if anything, he's going to – at least my, my vantage point, they're going to start the year with him until, like, Trey outdoes him on the practice field or there's an injury. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, again, me totally speculating – for what you give up and what you give, he, he, he's going to play immediately. That's quick. You know, I don't know what that looks like uh, exactly, but, you know, everybody in the locker room will know that it's borrowed time to your, to use your phrase. You know what I mean? Like it's just mm-hmm. hard to get everybody on the ship going in the same direction when the captain is not the guy who's going to be there when it needs to happen. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't, they, they made the decision that Jimmy G is not the starter months ago. You know, at, at this point, we're just, it's like a bad high school breakup. You know, like we got to, it's almost at the end of senior year. She, you know, he or she is still around, but like eventually we're going to go to college. So it's a, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things where like, well, we can keep hanging out and be professional and be kind and all those types of things, but, but we've moved on. So let's say this, I mean, the breakdown of Jimmy G as a player, was it the injuries? Was it the decision-making? What, you know, probably all of the above, but where was maybe the deficiencies that led them to just to make this move? I, I honestly don't know. I, I'm probably higher on Jimmy G than most people. Like, I, again, again, we're all on like half information, right? When we're not in the building, but I'm a massive fan of Jimmy G. I think when he's healthy now, again, you have to be healthy, but when he's healthy, he's better than people give him credit to be. I mean, he, he helped them get to the Super Bowl. If he hits that post late in the Super Bowl, none of this happens. Yep. I mean, really one throw. You know, and, and, and so, and there were a number of plays in that game that helped define that game that, that don't get mentioned quite as much, but you, you can really see how losing a Super Bowl sends ripples through an organization that you're dealing with, you know, they'll be dealing with this for another year, another couple of years with the draft picks. So it's just, uh, you know, I, I personally wish him the best. I've certainly been in situations where, you know, that it's over, but you're still there, you know, and so it's a, uh, I'm sure he'll be a pro and hopefully he lands in his feet. But again, the organizations that are looking for quarterbacks are not organizations that are usually, you know, on the cusp of winning. So wherever he goes, you know, it, it's going to be, it's probably going to be a tough, tough lift. Yeah, absolutely. And then right now they're dealing with the, uh, I guess the injury bug once again. And I know people like to say it's the training staff's fault or, or the coaching is too, too aggressive in the off season. But uh, what was your approach in the off season? I know you mentioned you didn't get reps and then in, in training camp, you got your turn, but I mean, do you think it's, valid right now to talk about reps in the off season or, or is this more this uh young millennial gen z era where they don't want to practice as hard and, and we should be more mindful of these reps so they don't have achilles or acl injuries at this point of the year yeah I, I probably would hedge away from the kind of generational statements like that to me it's a combination of uh the medical identification of a lot of these injuries has gotten better we've gotten away from the, you know, ultra and then really it start. I, I think I frame it more around the mental health element as far as like, Hey, you know, back in the day, you'd get dinged, you'd see stars Well, you're, your ass is right back in there, you know, as opposed to now, you know, if you, you know, if, if anything feels sideways, you're really uh, encouraged to share that information. So, you know, if I feel something in my hamstring and it's June, like, Let's pull back a little bit. We're not going to tough guy through this. And I, I personally think in the long run, it's a good thing. I think that it's hard for some guys who grew up with that old school kind of single bar mentality where like, we're going to fight through this. You don't get water, you know, that type of stuff. That stuff is in the past, man. Like it's not good for the game, uh, especially now that we're playing more games. I, I just, so many things are for me are, are put the player at a disadvantage. So anytime the player can grasp any sort of power specifically around their health, I, I really do encourage them to to kind of take care of themselves. You only get one body, you only get one shot at that thing, and so you better be a hundred percent when you get out there on the field because there's a lot of dudes out there that are going to go a hundred. Absolutely, as you said that, I was thinking on. I think uh, Nolan likes to start training camp uh, with the Oklahoma drill, and there was double days or two a days back then. Doesn't that just feel like such a bygone era? How much how much hitting and, and just how physical and long those days were. Yeah, and I mean. And you, and you got to think, I always think like at the learning to practice in the league is like its own skill. It really is. So much of it is not going to the ground, playing football fast on your feet. But yeah, those like original training camp days where you're like tackling people and doing like live goal line right out the gate, like 
just for what? Like, I, you know, none of those things are transferable nowadays, especially even with like how they teach tackling is, is changed from back in the day where, you know, I can remember watching uh, NFL films like before high school games, like knockout blows, like trying to crush someone. You know, now it's a penalty, you're kicked out of the game and rightfully so. It's, I think it just makes the game better. It's just a, it's a dinosaur mentality for a lot of pseudo tough guys that try to pretend like they were ballers back in the day when in reality, you know, what's good for the game is the longevity, the health of these players, all those types of things. Yep. We want to see George Kittle running around, running people over, not in practice, but in the games at <laughs> Levi Stadium. Uh, real quick, just to wrap it up. I mean, you mentioned the Niners were your team. You, what's your outlook on them now? Are you still, I, I guess, one of the, I don't want to say the faithful because that's a marketing term, but are, do you feel connected to the team as a former player or just watching what they've done under the Shanahan era? Uh, I mean, I feel grateful for the opportunity to have any sort of relationship with that with that uh, organization. But no, I, I'm more, I think I just play for so many teams that I'm more a fan of the people that I know and the people that are still in it. So I'll obviously root for Skanks uh, with the 49ers and a handful of other guys that are still old enough that are still going, uh, those types of things. But it's, for me, it, it, always, it always was and just kind of reinforced the idea of how important those relationships are, especially when you bounce around so much you know so yeah my career is a perfect example of you know Mike Martz believing in me that relationship kind of ending up getting more and more into it so I'm less tethered to a logo or to a city and I live in San Diego you know it's, it's tough to be an NFL fan down here and be tethered to a team you know just when you feel like you can get burned with them picking up and leaving those types of things so for me I, I'm a fan of football uh, I'm a fan of you know of people and so that's where I gravitate to. All right, so uh, I believe it was the NFC Championship game against the Packers, and Rob Lowe, the, the TV actor, was on. They, you got him on the broadcast with the NFL <laughs> logo hat. So if JTO yeah. goes to a game, just repping the shield. Do you know that I actually had that hat? Not, I think he was rocking the black one. I had the white one for like a hot minute in like junior high. I don't know why, but I have a. I definitely remember that. No, I w- I would probably rock uh, whatever whatever quarterback I knew. You know, back in the day, I felt like I knew every other dude. But now uh, I'm, I'm pretty old, so I don't know quite as many guys anymore. But it's, uh, I'm always cheering for the guys that I know. What's, what's the, the, I guess, the jersey collection or your keepsake looking like? Because you have the NFL Europe records and, and uniforms and, and CFL. Do you, do you hold on to that yeah. stuff? Or do you, are you more like a minimalist, like, you know, been there, done that, don't need to keep all the team swag? Uh, well, my, my wife actually decorated in here with the, the few helmets that are in here. I'm definitely more, not necessarily a minimalist by default, but most of the times, this is kind of like a peek behind the curtain. Most of the times when you leave an organization, it's not really on the best of terms. So like if I get cut, I'm not going to like very often like go down and like, hey, you know, I really want this helmet and this jersey. You know, I'm more of like, all right, I'm out of the building, you know, yeah. type of thing. And inevitably, most of the times I was really good friends with the equipment staff. And they would send me, you know, a box of crap. So I have in my attic, I probably have five different teams, boxes of stuff that I'm sure hopefully my kids will like to go through at some point. But at this point, it's probably like super big, like old school Reebok stuff that I'm not really going to, you know, take a whole lot of pride in rocking anymore. But it's a, you know, it's one of those things where it is my kids have fun putting the helmets on, but it's a, it's one of those things where I don't have the jerseys framed up or anything. Yeah, well, someday they'll they'll bring it out and dust it off for you. Uh, real quick to wrap it up, what's what's next on the on the YouTube channel? I know you're always looking for for fan user user generated ideas. Are you going to break down like current players? Are you still thinking more in the college space, or what's maybe like the the era of the landscape you're going for? I mean, right now I'm really excited for July because I take July off. But a, uh, it's really honestly, you touched on it right there. Like it's whatever kind of like the channel OGs want. Like I have, there's a number of people that like reach out to me consistently and they're always kind of a little bit ahead of the curve as far as who's going to be the next, you know, Zach Wilson next year, or who's going to be, you know, who's got, who's on the up as far as like, you know, Josh Allen, those types of things that people want to see more of. And I'm just naturally curious as well. I, don't, I honestly, I think it bothers people a little bit that I don't watch a whole lot of football during the season. Like I just don't, I, I, I don't sit down on Saturday and watch every college football game or Sunday. It's just not the way it works out. So I really do rely on the people that uh, want to see more to tell me. And I'm always on the lookout. I, the other part about the, the channel that has kind of evolved is the courses. So the courses really take a significant amount of time. And I'm in, kind of in the middle of two of those courses right now. So the next course will be on tempo. 
and the next course after that will be on the quarterback run game just because i i'm fascinated by both those elements they're they're really important parts of our coaching style with what we do and so that's kind of where my mind is right now but i'm if you got any good ideas let me know yeah well I, i'd love to see you break down your tape that would be interesting <laughs> dust off the old some, the old highlights and the low some, lights. some grainy tape man we'd have to like get the get the uh have to stretch that thing yeah okay well standard def and then uh Jaden daniels may ask you i'm a sun devil so i want to know i want to know if he's got yeah. a pro potential he's on the list he uh well the other thing and i mean it's you know uh, people always think like hey just do this one do this one bro i don't have every single all 22 of every person that's ever played and so it, it does take a little conniving to get that type of stuff but uh, that's a beautiful thing about the internet is people, if you put it out there, sometimes people will just reach out to you that have the information. That's honestly how it usually happens for me to get that college tape. And so I definitely want to do uh, the, that's the ASU quarterback, right? Daniel. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we'll he's look a, out for he's, that. He's in the, there yeah. you go. He's got to, he's got to get some more reps on the, they don't throw it enough, you know, a little more of like a running offense, but hopefully this year they'll let him unleash it a little bit. Who's the, uh, who's the coordinator in Arizona state? I feel like I know. I think I played against him in college. Zach Hill. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah I just think it. of a term, a terms, a terms program. Isn't he it's... like the CEO though? It's, I feel like he's like, he's got that like old, old OG model where he's like, I'll just tell you guys how to do this. And do the press you conferences. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, JT, this was a real treat. Uh, everyone listening, check out uh, the QB school on Instagram, on Twitter and the QB school, subscribe, rate, review, all that fun stuff on YouTube um thank you so much for your time really appreciate it. this is great yeah, my pleasure man anytime taylor